All right, now some of you may be saying, well, hold on, wait, what about the Protestant Reformation and the teaching of justification by faith alone? What about those great reformers like Calvin, Luther, uh, Melanchthon, etc., that preached justification by faith alone? What happened here? Well, while it is true that justification by faith alone was the predominant um, view of salvation of the Protestant uh, Reformation, we need to remember that the word alone right here is not found in the Bible, actually. And it was added in by man. The reformers, they had actually a partial view of the plan of salvation. They didn't have all the light on the issue. And the reason for this most likely is because God was leading um, them out of papal darkness. He was leading them out of the errors of Rome very slowly, giving them as much light as they could handle at the moment. We should be thankful for the life of John Wesley because through him, God was able to give a correct uh, picture of how justification and sanctification go together. It's not just one. Alright, hello there brothers and sisters and welcome back to another video by Zion's Watch and Media. And we are now on to another video in our series on the new theology. This series where we're looking at a lot of this new theology or these false doctrines that have come into God's remnant church or have tried to crep into God's remnant church. And we are comparing them with what the Bible actually says. And we're seeing the errors in them. And today we are going to be looking at the true gospel. What is the gospel? We're going to see some very interesting stuff in there. Now, the reason we want to look at this is because there is a false gospel being preached out there today, which says that when we come to Christ, he uh, justifies us in our sins and we continue to live in sin and the saints will continue to sin right up until Christ's second coming. And sanctification is not a vital element in the gospel for one to be saved. And for those of you who do not know, when we speak of justification, we're speaking about one being forgiven of his sins. And when we speak of sanctification, we're speaking about one being delivered from the power of sin or one having victory over sin. So to deny sanctification is basically to promote a sin and live theology. I can continue in my sins and still be saved. And this sin and live theology, it goes directly against and it is an attack against Christian character perfection. And it's actually um, not a new argument, even though we call it the new theology. It was seen actually in the 1700s by a theologian known as Count von Zinzendorf. And it would be John Wesley who would actually have to challenge um, Zinzendorf's ideas. And he would have to set the record straight when it came to Christian character perfection. And we read Wesley's words right here. In the works of Wesley, volume 6, sermon 76. This is John Wesley speaking. He said, Speaking about this issue on uh, Christian character perfection, he said this, There is scarce any expression in Holy Writ which has given more offense than this. The word perfect is what many cannot bear. The very sound of it is an abomination to them. And whosoever preaches perfection, as the phrase is, that is, asserts that it is attainable in this life, runs great hazard of being accounted by them worse than a heathen man or a publican. No, says the great man. So this great man is a man that is against Christian perfection. This is the error of errors. I hate it from my heart. I pursue it through all the world with fire and sword. Wesley replies, Why are those that oppose salvation from sin, few accept it, so eager? I had almost said furiously, Are you fighting pro aries et fotis for God and your country? For all you have in the world, for all that is near and dear unto you, for your liberty, your life. In God's name, why are you so fond of sin? What good has it ever done you? What good is it ever likely to do you, either in this world or in the world to come? And why are you so violent against those that hope for a deliverance from it? So here we see, uh, this is not a new argument. John Wesley, uh, that great uh, later reformer, had to go up against it as well. And sadly, this thinking that we cannot overcome sin, it has infected the minds of many Christians and those who preach the new theology. And it is the basis for much of the new theology, actually. And because of this thinking that we cannot live perfect lives above sin in this life, 
Um, it is said that the gospel consists mainly of justification or simply God declaring a person righteous and sanctification plays no part in it. And the new theologists still accuse those who believe that the gospel consists of both justification and sanctification as those people who are holding to a Catholic um, idea of salvation according to the Council of Trent. But as we saw in our video earlier in the beginning of the series, uh, we saw that this is not true actually. For even though the Catholic Church does teach that the gospel consists of both justification and sanctification, they are wrong in their view of sanctification. For in Catholicism, sanctification is built off of man's works or his um, merits in connection to the seven sacraments. While true Bible-based sanctification is completely different, it is based off of faith according to the Bible, as we will soon see. Alright, so let us look at a few points on what the gospel actually is. And the first point that we have here is that justification by faith, which is the first part of the gospel, is not only a forensic act. It's not just something that God declares in heaven and that's the end all be all. And that a man after he is justified can continue living in sin. No, it's not this once saved, always saved business. And it's very sad for if one does truly hold to this theology of um, once saved, always saved, there is no true difference between the sinner and the saint in their lifestyle actually for both are actually still trapped in sin. It's very sad. And some may try to use the writings of uh, Paul and Romans to try to justify this belief that we're justified only and it stops there. And they'll read Romans chapter 4 verse 5 where it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So Paul says it's not to the person that works, but to the person that believes and that the ungodly will be justified. Now, while it is true that God will justify the ungodly, since all of us are sinners when we come to him, this justification will not hold or cover the sinner if he chooses to remain in sin after he comes to Christ. No, God expects a transformation of life once one comes to him. And even though it's true that we are not saved by our works, as Paul says here, but works are the actual uh, fruit or the natural result of a person that truly does believe. They're the proof that one has an abiding faith or that one truly believes in Christ. And Jude verse 15 and 16 actually tells us what will happen to those who continue to remain in sin. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are mummerers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. So these sinners will have to um, face the judgment of God and execution. Also, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, speaking about homosexuality, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. So this verse is very clear that if we are participating in these sins, even if we um, are claiming to be Christians, we will be lost, brothers and sisters. We will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24, we read, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. So if a person has uh, been converted in the past and they are living a righteous life, if they choose to go back to sin, all of their past righteousness is gone and they will die in their sin unless they repent and come back to God and are justified again. Now, the Bible, on the other hand, teaches us very clearly that justification requires an entire surrender and transformation of the life. We read in Romans chapter 2, verse 13, For not hearers of the law are just before God, but doers of the law shall be justified. So it's those who keep the law that will be justified. And in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So it's those who forsake their way of wickedness, and those who forsake their wicked thoughts, 
and return to the Lord, those are the ones who will receive mercy or be justified by God. Also in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15, it says, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. Now this is a very fascinating verse. Think about it. For if it is an abomination to God for a person to justify the wicked, how much more absurd or crazy would it be for God himself to justify the wicked? He would be contradicting his word right here. No, it cannot be, brothers and sisters. The wicked or those who live in sin will not be justified in the end. They are in a lost condition and need to repent and be transformed. All right, so now let us see what uh, true justification actually brings to the righteous. We read in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So justification by faith gives the righteous peace. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from wrath through him? So justification by faith brings us salvation. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So justification by faith brings us grace, the grace of God that saves us. All right, the next point that we have here is that sanctification is God's perfect work for man through Christ. This is the complete opposite of those who try to teach that sanctification is man's imperfect work for God and that the saints will never be fully sanctified and will always be falling into sin until Christ's second coming, which is false. All right, now we've studied earlier that sanctification comes by faith alone and that man's works are simply the outworking of an abiding faith in Christ. And we saw earlier as well how sanctification is a gift from God. And uh, the Apostle Paul realized this as well in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, when he said this, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So how are we sanctified? It's by faith. This is how sanctification comes. Sanctification is by faith just as justification is by faith as well. We also see in the Bible that through the sacrifice of Christ, he brought to us not only justification, but sanctification as well. We read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So since Christ offered his body for us, we can be sanctified. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Okay? Ephesians chapter 3, verses 25 to 27, it says this, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And what was the reason that he gave himself for the church? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So without sin. So Christ died so that we could be sanctified and he intends to complete the sanctification in us to make us holy and without blemish or without sin in our lives. Now let us read a few promises of how God is going to sanctify his people and how it is his perfect work. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says this, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All right, so the work of sanctification is God's work. It's not man's work, but God's. Man has a part to play in this work by cooperating, but ultimately it's God who is at the root of the work. And in Titus chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, we read, Teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, we read, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. 
So God has chosen us to be sanctified. It starts with him, not us. And let us never forget, brothers and sisters, that we are completely dependent upon Christ in this work of sanctification, for we can do nothing good in and of ourselves. This is why we read in John chapter 15, verse 3, Christ said this, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So without Christ, we have no hope of ever being sanctified or cleansed from sin. We must stay connected with Christ if we want to gain the victory here. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 21, we read just on what Christ will do with us. It says, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So who is this one working out this perfection in our lives? It is Jesus Christ. He is at the root of it. So the sanctification is his work, not ours. He receives the credit for it. So we see from these verses very clearly that the gospel consists not only of justification by faith, but also sanctification by faith. Very beautiful. And that this work of sanctification is God's work that he will complete and perfect. He will sanctify us perfectly or cleanse us from all of our sins in the life. He will give us the victory if we cooperate with him. All right, now some of you may be saying, well, hold on, wait, what about the Protestant Reformation and the teaching of justification by faith alone? What about those great reformers like Calvin, Luther, uh, Melanchthon, etc., that preach justification by faith alone? What happened here? Well, while it is true that justification by faith alone was the predominant um, view of salvation of the Protestant uh, Reformation, we need to remember that the word alone right here is not found in the Bible, actually. And it was added in by man. The reformers, they had actually a partial view of the plan of salvation. They didn't have all the light on the issue. And the reason for this most likely is because God was leading um, them out of papal darkness. He was leading them out of the errors of Rome very slowly, giving them as much light as they could handle at the moment. We should be thankful for the life of John Wesley because through him, God was able to give a correct uh, picture of how justification and sanctification go together. It's not just one. And John Wesley, he actually extended the principles of the Reformation and showed that God has the ability not only to justify a person, but also to sanctify a person. The scriptures we will soon see actually link justification and sanctification together. All right, now the next point that we have here is that the gospel is both justification and sanctification. And we're just going to see this a little bit clearer with uh, some verses. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 to 13, this is the Lord's Prayer, uh, the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. It says this, And forgive us our debts, this would be justification, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is sanctification. And in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, we read this earlier. It says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, this is justification, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This is sanctification. And in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, this is justification, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, this is sanctification. I hope you're seeing the binding link between justification and sanctification. You don't have one without the other. And in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, this is justification, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit, this is sanctification. Revelation chapter 22 verse 11, He that is righteous, let him be righteous still, justification, and he that is holy, let him be holy still, sanctification. And we see it even in the spirit of prophecy. Amazing. We read this in Steps to Christ, page 62. He died for us, speaking of Christ, and now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in the place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. So this is justification, but it doesn't stop there. More than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. 
You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Then with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same good works, works of righteousness, obedience. This is sanctification. So we see it even in the spirit of prophecy, this link between justification and sanctification. Very beautiful. Brothers and sisters, the God that we serve is an all-powerful God. It doesn't matter what sins you may have committed in the past or what sins you may be in in this very moment, in this very second. Christ is able to break the chains and he is able to forgive you of all of your past sins and he can give you peace. Christ has the power to not only justify or forgive you, but he has the power to sanctify or to cleanse your life from all of its sins. This is a gospel of power, power to transform the life. And the Apostle Paul wrote about the power of the gospel in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 when he said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So if you will believe that Christ died for you to save you from your sins and that he will give you power to overcome your sins, you will then receive the peace and the power of the gospel into your own life. Now, brothers and sisters, man's merits have no place in this, for justification and sanctification is truly the work of God from beginning to end. But good works do play a part in it, for it is simply the proof that we have a real connection with God. Faith is the root, and works are the natural fruit. When we realize this, we will give all the praise to God, for our peace and our good works ultimately spring from Him. So this is the true gospel the gospel of justification by faith and sanctification by faith. Will you accept it into your life? We pray that you will. So that is the end of our presentation right here. We hope that you learned something and that you'll be able to share this information with your friends and your family. And if you like this video and you wanna learn more, be sure to subscribe below and to click on the bell and we will see you guys in the next one. Until next time, God bless.